Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And I'm not quite sure what our fusion name would be, but this is our thoughts on Steven Universe, seasons one through three. Not like anyone would really need this, but just in case, spoilers. And so that nobody can yell at us. One more time. Spoilers. I'll yell at us about that. Well, since you're the one who's watched it most recently, and I can jump in with my points, why don't you start? It's another one of those where Lux goes, you need to watch this. And I'm like, well, I caught like two episodes. It's okay. And then, of course, you sit down and binge watch it, and then you're like, this is a kid's show, right? <laughs> you guys see what you're doing here, right? Oh my god, you're explaining adult issues to children the correct way! <laughs> I didn't think this was allowable in the existing universe. I mean, we have everything from the life issue of my job sucks my soul out every day, I feel worthless because of it, to gay couples. <laughs> Very well hidden gay couples. Yes, and all sorts of relationship issues, positive and negative relationships, and responsibility, and transparency, and the appropriateness of lying in social situations. Mm -hmm. And concepts like how aging works, and your mental state, and how that has to deal with it, and just families, and weird families that are normal nowadays like realistically you could actually have a single father and three women helping taking care of a kid entirely possible they're probably not alien gems but the rest of it entirely possible mm -hmm. and you have this pretty normal nuclear family with connie and her parents yeah the mahesh warrens a very traditional Mm -hmm. And then you, like I said before, have Steven's family. <laughs> yes, but you also have Vidalia and Yellowtail with sour cream and onion. Mm -hmm. Very much a mixed family issue to deal with, with sour cream being Marty's son. Mm -hmm. Which That's I called the moment I saw that episode. I'm like, yeah, that's sour cream's father right there. I said it. I called it right when I watched the episode. Yes, and we were later proved right in Season 3 when Marty came back. Mm-hmm. Though that was one of the few things that I, like, yeah, I know what they're doing here and got it right. Most of the time I was just watching the first season, and then I got to that episode, and I went, There are fusion? Because I totally wasn't looking for that at all, and I did not get that they were a fusion until Jasper used that weapon on them, and wait a minute. Two gemstones? Huh? Yeah, and then you watch all the other episodes and you go, That so makes sense! Especially the episode where Connie and Steven fuse! And she goes, Enjoy it! You are an experience! Yes. Uh, if Garnet grinned anymore, she would have outdone the Grinch's evil grin. Except it would have been a whole lot more pleasant to look at. Well, yes, is... I liked Garnet anyways because like, well, Pearl's a little too uptight and Amethyst is a little too relaxed. They need someone in between and then there was Opal. So there was my in-between, literally. Mm-hmm. And it was like, Garnet's like always been my favorite of the um main gems. Steven's cool and everything, but Garnet is just, I like Garnet. <laughs> yeah, and it's hard to say she's my favorite crystal gem because... Technically, wouldn't she be my favorite fusion? Okay, crystal gems. Gems? Because <laughs> Sapphire and Ruby are pretty good on their own, too. Yes, for the little bit that we see of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and jumping all the way to season three, I just love that, you know, I saw it going this way, but I didn't. <laughs> and the, will you two stop flirting? <laughs> is important. Okay, I know the rubies are down, but come on. Can we really get away with all of this? <laughs> uh, that's going back to you and probably back to season one or so. <laughs> well, there's just so much that happens, and there's so many little details that add up later. Mm -hmm. That's one of the good things about this show, is it does a really good job of not front-loading you with information. I mean, it even drops you just right in the middle of how things work. 
I usually hate it when shows do that, but this one does a good job of explaining things afterwards and giving you little hints about how the universe and how the world and how the gyms and everyone work. It doesn't just drop you in the middle and continue to drop you in the middle, like a lot of serialized shows where it's an episode a week and each episode is self-contained and nothing changes. No, each one of these episodes is different from the last and each episode is adding more information and more personality and world building. You don't just get left with nothing. There's always a little bit of something in each episode. And even episodes where, okay, we're not having any big, you know, crystal gem, any missions, any mutant gems, any of that stuff, you're still getting so much world building. Like with the episode where they do the play. Hmm. You get so much backstory there, not just of how Beach City was founded, but earlier interactions of the Crystal Gems with humans. Mm -hmm. And all these different stage performances. So we had the play, you know, the talent show. God, we learned so much about Sadie in that episode. And Steven is such a ham. <laughs> He's also very comfortable in drag. I could say he grew up with three women, but... <laughs> yeah, they're not really human women, so they don't really have all the culture, but... <laughs> like I said, I could say that it doesn't really add up. It's more, I think, that he grew up in a household that didn't have humanized social norms. Mm -hmm. So he's not set in how human society works even though he has a better idea of it than the gyms do uh, and i do like we get a lot of nice at least one so far bad guy conversion as it were Ah, <laughs> uh, yes peridot i have trouble saying it as peridot i always grew up saying it peridot uh, she's a character and i don't know why i didn't really think about it this way but when i first saw her i didn't really think that her limbs were artificial until other people online started pointing out that they're probably artificial. I'm like, that makes sense now that I think about it. Especially later when they yank part of it off and she doesn't poof. Yeah, that, that's pretty good evidence that they were artificial, which is obviously later confirmed. Mm -hmm. This is another reason I said spoilers at the beginning just to be on the safe side. Because <laughs> all these little things, like they're, they hint at this stuff throughout the series. And then they have these really nice big reveals, like with Garnet, and you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the capture of Peridot and everything that we learn from that, you know, and the whole thing with the cluster. And oh my god, could that resolution have been a little more Tenchi Moyo? You remember all the Tenchi Moyo series. The Tenchi. All the women come to Earth to, like, destroy it, and they make friends. The Reverse Harem series. <laughs> they all end up making friends with him, and then they have to go up against whatever big baddie is, you know, causing all the problems, and Tenchi just goes in and goes, stop it, and they're like, oh, okay. Ah, well, it's been forever since I've seen any of those, and I barely remember any of them. I Mainly because I've seen several shows like them. You know, I've, been, I've watched enough anime to see stuff recently that was better than it, and also retreated enough that I'm like, I... Yeah, I'm just saying it's very much like that because we have a conversion of Peridot. We have Steven getting along with Lapis, who doesn't get along with anybody. Okay, she kind of gets along with Peridot later, but seriously, she only likes Steven. And then, okay, we're going to go destroy the cluster. But then he has like this mental fusion thing with the cluster. He's like, we can't destroy it. It doesn't want to hurt anything. It's like, it's still going to though. By what it wants to do, it's going to wreck things. Mm -hmm. ah. So that's speaking of wonderful moments. Let's go back to the end of season one. <laughs> oh, you mean like Garnet's song that I listened to about 60 times. And no, I still can't sing it correctly because I don't have all the lyrics down. Uh, yeah, la that. <laughs> that. That was like, this, uh, that's the actual end of season one, but anytime you go to watch it through um, sites, they always have the end of season one la where, where Lapis tries to go back to Homeworld. That's not the actual end of season one, but a lot of places where you can go buy it or watch it will say that's season one and 
where the homeworld gems come back to Earth as the end of season two, but that's not how even the official site lists how the episodes work. We have season one ending right when the homeworld gems arrive and that whole thing resolves. Season two starts when, um, I believe it actually starts right after Connie and Steven kind of make up, which was another great moment. I love that moment because that's supposed to be the whole hero being stubborn moment. I'm breaking up with this person to save their lives and everything. And I love how they break that trope. They just break it hard because he shows up and he goes, oh, I, I still want to be friends. I just, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just, and like, yeah, that that's awesome right there. Mm -hmm. This show does a really good job of breaking a lot of tropes, but making you believe they're going to follow it. And then, <laughs> well, that was a trope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not much left of it. Yeah, that, that broke into a lot of shards. Do we have to bubble those? <laughs> uh, uh, just all the relationships, period, and how they're actually complex actually complex and they take actual time between the characters to resolve like between greg and amethyst and greg and pearl i was going to go for between pearl and garnet because that whole sardonyx thing oh my god pearl i can't believe you did that yeah but i'm talking about earlier in the series <laughs> and one that was just recently resolved in season three yes was greg and pearl and nice music in that episode, and also Pearl looked really put together in that tailored suit. Mm -hmm. and speaking of music, the first songs were okay and good and catchy, but they just got better as the series went along. And jokingly, can I drive my van into your heart? <laughs> Please, go over to my Patreon. Mid-episode plug, check! <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> or it's over isn't it no it's not we're only part way in <laughs> uh, subscribing don't cost nothing <laughs> uh, you'll probably hear this stuff again at the end of the episode people <laughs> <laughs> so please continue maybe we should move on to favorite parts from season two uh, pretty much most of the stuff with Peridot, just because she's having so many issues and, you know, her conversion, and she's still not fully over. It's like, she doesn't really want to be with the Crystal Gems, but, you know, she sees reasons that the Earth should not be destroyed. Mm hmm And I love the snap that happens at the end of the season with her yelling at Yellow Diamond and calling her, you clod! Yes. And then breaking the connection and going to the Crystal Gems. Will you take this communicator, please? Yeah, sure, why? Because it can be detonated remotely. <laughs> oh, crud, bro! <laughs> uh, and I love it. It's just, what are you? And I'm like, you're one of us now! I'm just like, yay! <laughs> like, no! Ah. Uh. So many excellent things. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't know why it took me so long, but it took me forever to realize what she was calling them, what it actually meant. I don't know why my brain took so long to realize that she was calling them a clod. She was calling them dirt. Yes. Plain dirt. That's an insult for a gem. Yes. I don't know why it took me so long. When I, I watched it basically till the end of season two, and I went, wait a minute. She's calling them dirt, isn't she? <laughs> Yes, and by specifically saying Claude, because that's a cluster of, of dirt. dirt. What is a gem? A cluster of minerals. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. I'm just wondering if I can go into nitpicking yet. You can go into nitpicking anytime you want. Okay, Steven's healing powers. <laughs> First thing, right there. Yes, because issues. Okay. So the healing power is in his saliva. We've already proven that he doesn't have conscious control of it because he accidentally heals Connie's eyes with backwash. Also, here's the thing. I don't think it's really healing because her eyes were probably bad from when she was born. That's nothing really wrong with her body. It's 
bad and we usually fix it, but it wasn't something that her body would have normally fixed, otherwise it would have fixed it on its own. So Stephen's powers are more of like a correction, restoring something to the way it should be somehow, knowing how it should be? Yes, which in the crystalline structure of a gem makes sense, but for the overall DNA of a human, okay, how does the power know? Based on his own body. That's but, how it knew how to fix a human body into a... But that implies that there's nothing wrong with his body, and he's only half human. He's a human gem hybrid. Mm -hmm. There's those questions right there of like, how does it know how the body quote unquote should be? Yes, and the healing power, I wasn't even going to go this direction yet, also works on inanimate objects because he's fixed the warp and he healed the tears on his stuffed bear. But if it's subconscious and it heals things and restores things back to the way they should be, how does he manage to eat anything? <laughs> Probably because he fully swallows it. That's the thing. If he eats something, his body will process it. But if he spits it back out without actually eating it, that's when you get something like the Melon People episode. Yes. Yes. But at the same time, if we're going that route, what happens if you get something stuck in your teeth? I don't know. But another episode my brain just reminded me of, one that they, another example of them doing writing correctly, is an episode... That freaked me out when I first watched it. The first time Steven figured out how to use his transformation ability. Oh my god. That, Cat fingers. That was a perfect example of how a character who doesn't know how to properly metamorphosize their body slash transform their body should react the first time they learn how to do it. Because it could go horribly wrong in exactly that way. And I'm surprised they got away with it, because it's horrific. It is, but if you look at everything the show gets away with, mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of the less, because there's that. But then you also have the episode with Dr. Mahesh Warren at the hospital at night with the gem mutant. Yeah, and speaking of nitpicks, I have a nitpick on that episode, specifically on her doctor talents. They don't have pulses. Oh, maybe not. Maybe it wasn't her. Maybe her nurses. Maybe I should blame her nurses. They don't have pulses. How did these patients get checked in when they were moving without pulses? Shouldn't they have a cold and emergency doctor? Because the te technically the patient's dead even though they're moving? Or do you just send them straight to the morgue and, you know, those are death throes? Also, look at the bodies. They're obviously not human. Yeah. And, okay. Rose Quartz's room. Let's talk about that. Why would Rose have a room that can just, it's basically fantasy land, creates whatever you want. Why would she have a room like that? Also, all the trouble Steven gets into when he uses that room. After going in there the first time, why would he go back and why would he take Connie? That was a very creative episode. I especially like the ending. Like, isn't there something you want to tell her, Steven? <laughs> You want to tell her! They're like, yeah, the room is... You told the room to do what it wanted to... This is going to end poorly. Never give the computer program free will. That, uh, it's also the whole problem of what happened that one episode of Star Trek, where Jordy basically asked the computer to create a holographic program that could beat Data at his own game. He should have said Sherlock Holmes, but no, he said Data, so the computer went... Oh, you mean Lieutenant Data. Let me create a program that will defeat Lieutenant Data. <laughs> Whoops! You just created a super smart Moriarty. Good job! <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of like that. Just a little bit. And I mean, I understand that he wanted to, you know, share this experience with Connie and they could rewrite the book because she didn't like the ending. He couldn't just admit that he liked the ending. And she's not even surprised. She's like, yeah, I figured. You like schmaltz. <laughs> You're Steven. <laughs> Me and you would probably have the same thing. Yeah, but the thing is, he has valid reasons for why that ending works. He goes back 
through the books and points out instances between Nicarius and and the heroine that make sense and they're different than the points that Connie picked up on during her read through of the books. So it also goes back to show that two people can look at the exact same thing and see it very differently. Mm -hmm. It's also a good example of how people who see things completely differently can still enjoy the book together without trying to kill each other in flame wars. <laughs> Sorry, internet. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you please continue? <laughs> Any more nitpicks? Because apparently you have plenty like usual, I wouldn't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think I was actually done with the healing powers yet. <laughs> then please continue. Okay, we prove in the very beginning that the healing powers are subconscious because he did not heal Connie intentionally. Mm -hmm. So how does a change in his emotional state cause him to lose the healing ability? The same way it does it for everything else. His emotional state has to be like stable or he has to figure out how to... Or he has to figure out how his emotions connect to that power so he can stabilize himself to be able to use that power. Yes. But why do all his powers have to be tied to his emotions? What is this, Super Princess Peach? Don't make me imagine stuff like that. <laughs> Especially since now I'm going to go over and draw it. I'll be right back. <laughs> no, no, as you can tell, that is not the drawing for this episode. <laughs> yeah, he does try to start them before we start the recording, so... <laughs> Try is the key word there. Yes. But yeah, we could just get overall into the gemology of it. It's like, how do the different gradations in gem society work? I can see pearls kind of being more of possessions because pearls are not technically minerals. That reminds me of another theory that people have with pearls. They think pearls are more artificial than the other gems because pearls are not really gems either. They're a creation of pressure and sand and stuff inside of clamps. Yeah, so it starts with a bit of debris, like a grain of sand, or in the case of artificial pearls, a small bead, a core, and then layers of nacre are secreted over that. So pearls are really only in the um, birthstone gemstone mix because alexandrite turned out to be so rare because alexandrite was the original dune birthstone and they switched it over to pearl because apparently we kind of overmined alexandrite or overestimated how much there was total side point though i trying to remember is there a gem named alexandrite not that i recall offhand i'm sure there is one hmm weird because that, that name sounds familiar hmm. please continue <laughs> okay so i don't expect the fusions to logically make sense. I will state that right now, mm -hmm. that they don't have to logically make sense. But Ruby and Sapphire are both corundum. It's basically the same stone. It's only because of human phrasing that a red sapphire is called a ruby. So rubies and sapphires are essentially the same stone, corundum. So why is a blue sapphire a noble and a red ruby an incredibly stupid in most cases, grunt soldier. Hmm. Also, if the rubies are that dumb, why do you have them guarding the nobles? Use them as frickin' shock troops. And that was another one of my favorite episodes, the episode where we find out the backstory between Ruby and Sapphire and how they met. Yes. And I know I said that I wasn't going to say fusions have to make sense, but corundum is like an eight on the hardness scale. So you take two corundums together and you get garnet, which is only like, a two or three if i'm recalling correctly it's much lower on the hardness scale so i'm sure the creators have some logic behind it but that gemstone logic is not it because garnet and pearl well pearl wouldn't technically mix with anything so any fusion with pearl like rainbow quartz or sardonyx has absolutely no logic gemological basis and i can see the diamonds being at the top because diamonds are tens that makes sense. Hmm. What's the name for fake diamond? Cubic zirconia. Hmm. I wonder if we have any cubic zirconia out there because cubic zirconias are just as hard as real diamond, correct? I believe so. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Ooh. Ooh. My brain just went, a fusion between Connie, Stephen, Garnet, 
Amethyst and Pearl. Sounds a little crowded. Yes, but... <laughs> Ooh. To make it even more crowded... Peridot or Lapis? Peridot and Lapis. Cupid Zirconian. Yes, except that Peridot doesn't feel comfortable with the idea of fusion. And I think Lapis is a little too... Um, I'm going to call her a gloomy goth, but she's act legitimately traumatized, yeah, so... I I'm saying further along in this series, when more of this stuff has been emotionally resolved. Yeah, because Lapis's experience with fusion was very bad. Yeah, she had an extremely abusive relationship. That reminds me of the end of that particular episode where after the fusion and she gets dra and drags herself into the deep of the ocean, Garnet just goes, lifts her glasses. That is a very bad <laughs> Those two are very bad for each other. <laughs> And how they address that and how that affected Lapis. They go over that in season three, which is amazing. You know, Lapis even talks about how she misses it because she's got so used to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very characteristic of an abusive relationship. Exactly. That's what I mean about those episodes. Like, they, they hide things in plain sight. And it gets right past the censors, right into kids' homes. They learn about actual things. Yeah. And like when Jasper comes on the boat and begs her to come back, I'm changed, it'll be different this time. All classic abusive relationship yeah. signs. You taught me how to love. Come back, it'll be different. I need you, I can't live without you. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand before, I do now. It's The fusions are kind of a difficult thing to deal with because they are established to be relationships because... When the postal carrier falls for Garnet, Connie and Steven are like, but Garnet can't, she's in a relationship. She, she is, is a, a relationship. relationship. <laughs> so the fusions are both a relationship and an experience. Mm -hmm. And the fandom has highly sexualized them. And watching the series, I cannot blame them because there is so much subtext and connotation there that it can very easily be taken that way. Mm -hmm. Though the one thing... The creators have said is it's not a sexual thing. Fusion is not equation to human sex. It's more of a representation of a relationship, not what the people do in the relationship. Right. I have heard that, but watching the series, I can very much see how the fan base would mm -hmm. take it that way. And just because so much of the phrasing, I mean, in season three, during the car race against Kevin, where Stefani diffuses and Connie and Steven are talking, they're like, he's the reason we fused. And just the realization of what that meant, of the taint that that put on the relationship, mm -hmm. that we did this thing that's representative of our relationship, and it was manipulated by this other person. And then going back to Pearl's deception with Garnet in order to create the Sardonyx fusion more often. And Sardonyx is a very interesting fusion. It's a very interesting personality. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to point out that Sardonyx and Peridot are both my birthstones. <laughs> yeah, and what's really interesting about Sardonyx is the fact that she apparently can see past the fourth wall. So I was like, <laughs> this brings a whole new layer into the show. Yeah, well, if you think about it, Sapphire and through Sapphire Garnet have future vision. So combine that with Pearl's data overload, it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. So Sardonyx knows she's a fictional creature that exists in a fictional world on a TV show. And just runs with it because out of all the fusions, and I think almost out of all the gems, she seems to have quite the sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Please continue. I bet you there's more nitpicking since I keep interrupting you. Okay, seriously, all the stuff with Lion. Oh, Lion. Lion's cool. I like Lion. He is such a cat. I mean, he is such a cat. Oh, I'm going to ignore you now. But I want attention now. But I'm going to ignore you now. <laughs> yes. Not around when I need you. Sleeping all the time. Not listening. 
Not taking commands, not responding to begging. Though that reminds me of something interesting I noticed in the series. He doesn't listen to Stephen directly most of the time. He listened to Stefani instantly, not just because they were in a fight, but I think he listens to Stefani directly. He'll obey Stefani, but he won't obey Stephen or Connie when they're unfused. Maybe Stefani is more similar to Rose Quartz hmm. because Lion has been directly tied back to Rose Quartz. He had her sword. He was guarding that pillow. He watches out for Stephen. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, okay, all of this. So where did Lion come from? Because so far it's been established that Rose's power was over plants and creating those fighting plants. Mm -hmm. So where did Lion come from? Where has he been all this time? Did Rose create him somehow before Stephen was born? Specifically to watch out for Stephen or... Especially since Pearl, Garnet, and Amethyst don't know about Lion until he gets introduced. And then they're all later going, oh... I guess it is kind of obvious that he belongs with Rose. I mean, he's pink. Mm -hmm. Also, his name kind of reminds me of a flower. A little bit. There's just so many unanswered questions there. And he's very important to the story. And not just because of his abilities. I mean, his abilities rock. Mm -hmm. Quite literally. <laughs> but much. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, all right, so continuing nitpicking. On to relationships within the town. Okay, Stephen's just a little kid. Why do the older teenagers want to, are willing to, hang out with him? On multiple occasions, he's gotten together with Buck, who is like the coolest kid in town and the mayor's son. He's had good conversations with Sour Cream. Most of his interactions with Lars happened at the Big Donut, so that's kind of give or take. Because that's Lars's job, but... Steven can go right up to Buck and Sour Cream and the others, no problem, where Lars, who is in the same age group, has difficulty with this and is not in the same clique. Usually older kids don't like to hang out with younger kids. Let's move on from that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I had to have watched ahead. <laughs> I'm currently caught up on the show she is not. <laughs> I stopped at the end of season three so that we could get this recording to be up through season three without me doing season four contamination. Uh, so please continue. <laughs> no, because now you give me other things to think about. You know how I extrapolate data. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at times Stephen does act very mature, so he could get along with the older kids. But, you know, you would think be hanging out more with Petey and less with Ronaldo. Got all the fun with Keep Beach City Weird and the blog and his episode where he does the documentary and... Lizard people! And then he actually figures it out and you're like... <laughs> 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 Intelligent rocks! <laughs> Can't say anything, I'm just gonna leave. Oh, and the whole thing that goes on with Ronaldo, Lars, and Sadie. And then there's that whole... What was it? Was it a lighthouse or something? Uh-huh. Yeah, that was a real interesting episode. Especially since it was kind of shifting towards the paranormal, and then you realize, oh, it's just a gem. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. We see all these things that seem like they could be paranormal, and, you know, Ronaldo gets so interested, and, oh, it's just gem activity. Everything that has happened in Beach City <laughs> is somehow related to the crystal gems. Hey, look at all these holes. Isn't this interesting? Well, that was because of this. <laughs> Speaking of interesting things, I want to know what the statue, the palace, or whatever you call it, where the gems live, temple. represent. The temple represents. Because <laughs> it's obviously a fusion. It's gotta be. The question is, is it a fusion between all of them? Well, the original gems, the um, garnet, amethyst, pearl, and rose? Or was it rose... Um, but has a bit, has a bit. <laughs> Bismuth. Yeah. That and the others? Or is it someone we're going to meet later? Because it doesn't look like any of the fusions we've seen so far. Another question. How many gems can you have together in a fusion? Because before I knew that Garnet was a fusion, fusion between Garnet and Pearl and fusion between Garnet and Amethyst, I always thought was just two. But that's technically three. 
So when it's all three of them together, it's technically a fusion of four. Also, I think it's actually order of operations too. If it was all three separated, if it was Pearl, Ruby, and Sapphire fusing all at the same time, I think we would get someone different than with just Garnet and Pearl fusing. And if we had Sapphire and Pearl fuse, then Ruby fuse in, we'd probably get someone else different as well. Yes, I think it's permutations as, as opposed to combinations where the order of the fusion matters. Mm -hmm. And that was another nice thing about the Ruby Sapphire flashback episode where we get to see how they meet because all of this time, almost all the fusions have been between differing gems. And when we get the flashback episode, we get that, oh, that's not how things are done on, on Homeworld. On Homeworld, you fuse with the exact same gem and you don't get a new combination. You get a bigger, stronger version of the existing gem, like what we see with the ruby fusions. So we now understand why Jasper was like, and this disgusting display, gesturing at Garnet, because cross gem fusions are an anthema, which goes back to the homeworld gem hierarchy of every gem type having a defined role and there being absolutely no crossover. Mm -hmm. Please continue with your nitpicks or thoughts on episodes and I'll jump in like I have been. <laughs> Derailing the conversation. Conversation. Yes, well, you brought them up a while back, but let's go back to Stephen's watermelon people. So not only did he have healing spit, but he had spit that turned watermelon seeds into sentient cr fighting creatures that were capable of learning as we see through both that episode because of the sacrifice that baby melon makes to stop them but the later episode where steven sleep merges into one of them that was so sad it's like dude the one you fused with died because you fused with it and were in taking control of it and you couldn't do nose goes fast enough because you didn't know what was going on <laughs> you are directly responsible for that watermelon's death also where and how did those sacrifices start because malachite's coming up there looking for steven but jasper always calls steven rose so why is the malachite fusion saying steven when Lapis is usually in control. Lapis would say Stephen, but Jasper usually calls Stephen Rose. And the way they're disguising the melon as Stephen is by putting Stephen's star on the sacrificial melon person. But Jasper would recognize Stephen by the gem, not by the t-shirt. So why paint the star emblem? Why not a fake gem hmm. and how long has that been going on and why is malachite looking there what's drawing her to that specific location it do the watermelon people give off some sort of aura because they came from steven so they have a similar feel they have a rose quartz feel to them hmm. also where did the dog and the horse come from steven only created watermelon people and what we saw growing in the fields were watermelon children. So where did watermelon dog and watermelon horse come from? I didn't even notice the watermelon horse. I just noticed the watermelon dog. The watermelon horse was the one that pulled the wagon when they came up to the huh. house and they dropped off the young child. Yeah, I realized I completely glossed over that. I was only focusing on the person. No, so where did those come from? Hmm. Also, why does Steven have this ability? I could see having a connection with the melons because mm -hmm. he created them. I could see being able to reach Lapis because she's a gem and she's special to him. But why could he reach Lars and Kiki? How could he take over Lars? We skipped most of that episode. Couldn't do it. I didn't have the three days it would have taken me to watch it by pausing. <laughs> I'm going to try to make it through that episode sometime, but I just watched it and went, 
I know exactly how this episode is going to play out. I'm not going to watch it because I know of that. I pretty much just skipped right to the end of the episode to get to the resolution. <laughs> and then the whole thing with Kiki, that's shared dreaming as opposed to taking over. And the examples with the Melon people and with Lars were basically mental possession where what happened with Lapis and Kiki was dream communication, except that Lapis was awake and Kiki was in the middle of a nightmare. So Steven is like a MacGuffin of powers. He has anything they can think of, he ends up with. Well, maybe he does have a limit. We just haven't found it yet. Like a certain man who can punch something only once. <laughs> yes, but that's, he's kind of a one trick pony. He's super strong and that's, it. Steven has everything. Powerful bubble, powerful shield, awesome sword, healing abilities, the ability to create fighting plants that will protect him, the ability to jump and control the speed and rate of his ascent and descent. Which also includes making it so things can't force him down, so he can actually put himself in one spot and stay there. Yes. Which he didn't think of using up in space when he was bubbled. He could have actually moved himself in any direction he wanted to if he was thinking about it because he's in constant free fall. So he says he can control his fall and descent. He may even be able to control his direction, which he could have used to direct himself back to Earth. Yes, but as he said to Amethyst that one time, half the time he forgets to use the floating ability. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have thought I would have been lucky to remember to bubble. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's kind of an automatic thing. Also, that bubble seems to be able to generate its own atmosphere, specific an atmosphere that he can breathe and so can connie yes but let's not forget in season three that he actually opens the bubble when he has to kick the eyeball ruby out how does he survive that atmospheric pressure change the pressure change is what it because you can actually survive in a vacuum like that for a decent amount of time not super long but i mean a decent amount of time the amount of time it would take to unbubble and rebubble because it's surprising you don't instantly die going into space it's the fact that if you went from full pressure to zero pressure instantly, it would kill you. And though Steven isn't human, we also get the we also get Steven asking the question that everyone's been asking for a while once they realized what Steven was. It's like, what would happen if you disconnected the gym from Steven? Yeah, it's like, does he poof? Does he die? Does he revert to being full human? The thing is, I'm afraid they're going to tell us <laughs> by having it happen. I like how you did that. I'm afraid they're going. That's why I laughed. It was the nervous kind of laugh. It was like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And while we're on various things and things, how did they get this past the sensors? Okay. Basically, every fusion, because the gems are referred to as she, even though they're essentially genderless or at least without humanized sexual characteristics. So every fusion is female-female, except when Steven fuses. Steven and Connie is a male-female fusion. Steven and Amethyst is a male-female fusion. The PBS show Dragon Tales wouldn't even let cross-gender dragon riding happen. The girl who was older had to be carried by the short pink dragon that was about her height, while the smaller boy was carried by a very large blue dragon that was male. We couldn't even have cross-gender dragon riding, but here we're having cro cross-gender fusion? Uh, we should probably start wrapping things up. No kidding. <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty sure you have plenty more to talk about, but I'm thinking we should start wrapping things up, or at least summarize your final ideas. Yeah. Because this is going to be a pain to edit. <sighs> well, you know, we could have done this when I finished watching season two. <laughs> it probably would have been a lot shorter. <laughs> well, since we're here now... <laughs> okay... Weapons. Oh, yes, weapons. So, apparently the gems generate the weapons and pull them from their gems. So, how can Bismuth do add-ons? Because we see the add-ons that she gives to Garnet, Pearl, and Amethyst be immediately incorporated. But it doesn't sound like she made Rosa's shield, only Rosa's sword. 
And Stephen doesn't carry the sword. It's carried inside of Lion. Mm -hmm. So are the weapons that Amethyst, Garnet, and Pearl generating their natural weapons? And Rose's shield was her natural weapon? And the sword, we know Bismuth made the sword, but did she make it from scratch? Because what she gave to the main three gems were enhancements to existing weapons. And if these are enhancements, how do they get incorporated to the gem physiology? Hmm, lots of questions. And with how good this show's been, I have a feeling we'll get answers to them further down the road. Yes, but also, since we're on season three and Bismuth, because Bismuth's talking murder. Shattering a gem is murder. Mm hmm And I think one of the main reasons Rose didn't want to use that weapon is because she knows about escalation. If the Crystal Gems would have started using weapons like that, Homeworld would have started using weapons like that. I mean, look at the weapon Homeworld did end up using. A weapon that basically scrambled the brains of every gym vulnerable at the time. The only ones that survived were ones that were protected by Rose or weren't on planet. So yeah, imagine how much worse it could have been if Rose had escalated to the gem equivalent of a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. But you have that and you have Rose and Steven both coming to the same conclusion and turning down Bismuth in the same way. But then by the end of season three, you find out that Rose did commit murder. Probably in the defense of someone or completely by accident. Either way, but still, mm -hmm. that's something that I hope gets elaborated more on in season four of the reason and the circumstances of why Rose did that. Because we already have it established that Rose was against shattering gems on a large scale. And we know that Stephen feels the same way. And it's another emotional thing that he has to deal with that his mother, his wonderful mother, did this thing that he already knows because of bismuth that rose does not condone so what could drive someone who doesn't want to take that step to take that step how bad were things that this had to happen mm -hmm. i also love how he completely skipped over one particular episode technically it's not canon uh the crossover episode <laughs> Which was actually really fun. It probably would have been more fun if I actually watched Uncle Grandpa, but yeah, I just can't. Yeah, that show doesn't, doesn't agree with my sensibilities, as it were. It's just not my show. Whoever watches it, perfectly fine. I have no problem with that. I'm just like, yeah, but I did enjoy the episode because I can enjoy things. I can let myself enjoy things because, one, I knew it wasn't canon. So it didn't ruin anything for me. I mean, even the episode itself says, good thing this isn't canon. <laughs> Don't worry, kid. This isn't canon. Uh, it also gave us great moments like Pearl completely. <laughs> ah, this doesn't make any sense. Kill it. <laughs> yes. And a little nod to the fandom of having the lizard have a gem sona. <laughs> Uh, that was a great episode. You could tell that it was actually moved, too, to match more up with when it was supposed to release. Because it still has Steven dealing with his bubble problem. But in the actual canon episodes, he already dealt with it. And things were starting to work out for him. It wasn't the bubble. It was the shield. He kept calling bubble when he was trying to call shield. Okay, that's what I meant. He was still having issues with his weapon. But by the time they actually showed the episode... He already had it solved in the canon show. But they moved it up so it would land on April Fool's. So it even more set up the fact that this is not a real episode. This is just something the two creators wanted to do for the fun of it. So should we move on to our final thoughts? Looks at the time. <laughs> uh, you'll have to forgive Lex. He does the editing. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't so. have any more. I'm okay with that. I'm just <laughs> worried about my hard drive space, too. <laughs> yeah, that's not in budget. <laughs> You've seen our production values. That's definitely not in budget. <laughs> All right. Another nitpick, small one, and then we'll go ahead and close it. 
Steven always pressuring the whole I love you, especially with Lion, the because he's like, blink if this means you love me, and blows on his eyes to make him blink. I'm like, are you that starved for affection? You have three gems that are completely devoted to you. You have a loving father. You have friends. You have a girlfriend. Well, it's the whole not having a mother thing. I'm thinking that's what's part of it. So, you know, final thoughts, and then I'll move on to mine. <laughs> really enjoy the show. Looking forward to starting season four. Hopefully the universe allows me time. <laughs> know the feeling. Especially when Breath of the Wild's coming out soon. <laughs> Nintendo uh, 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 opens up his wallet. Moths fly out. Uh, look at the calendar. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Were you, did you have any more final thoughts? I was trying to keep it short. Thank you. I can't wait for more episodes myself, but since I have caught up, I'm going to have to wait till next year, since that's when they are apparently scheduled to release. Ah, can't wait to watch what has been released for, for season four with Ember, so we can get back to you and do more recordings. Especially if they finish releasing season four by the time she ends up watching it. <laughs> and this has been our thoughts on Steven Universe, seasons one through three. And that, thank God, is a wrap. Uh, except no click and subscribe don't cost nothing but support on patreon that costs something giving someone a coffee that costs something and moving on to actual not singing <laughs> ah no wait visiting my deviant art that no way <laughs> going to deviant art don't cost nothing Going to Tumblr, don't cost nothing. Uh, how do we wrap that up? <laughs> Probably just with dead silence. Maybe add in some crickets.